Welcome to the first main module, the Cloud and Microsoft Azure 101. Really looking at the fundamentals of using the cloud and Microsoft Azure specifically. So our goal here will be to look at absolutely what are the types of cloud service that are available. When I think of, well, there's public cloud, obviously, but there's private cloud, there's hybrid, and there's other types that I wanna to quickly touch on. Some basics around Microsoft Azure, understanding what are the types of as a service. You'll hear about IaaS and PaaS and SaaS and others. So what do they really mean and why do we really care? And then how do I get access to Azure and what are the types of subscriptions available? So if I think about cloud services, there are many types of cloud service available. Now they could be hosted in different places. I can think about, well, within an organization, my own infrastructure, and I'm gonna use that to host a cloud. This is a private cloud. It's used only by me, my company. And with it being a private cloud, people within my organization have full access to all of the aspects, the underlying infrastructure, the operating systems, hypervisors, the management orchestration layer. The users in your company, they won't. You'll give them access to a certain amount, a certain quota to control usage. But you do control all the aspects, which means you do have all of the responsibility. See, if I was to think about the idea of the private cloud, well, I have data centers. So you have various data centers in your various locations. And those data centers, what are they really giving you? They're giving you capacity. So I have capacity in my locations, and then what I make available through that capacity are different types of resource. Now, what's very common on premises is a VM. So I'm like, hey, you make a, a VM available, maybe you make containers available, maybe you make certain databases available on a hosted database platform, whatever that is. What you put in front of all this is a management, an orchestration layer that gives users a portal or some interface to go and request service and interact with it. I can show them how much they've used. I can maybe charge back different business units. So a private cloud is really just that management layer I put on top of maybe existing capacity, existing infrastructure, existing hypervisors. The private cloud is just those interactions and certain features that are lit up. Then moving on from that, well, I absolutely have this idea of some external party hosting the cloud that primarily I think about, well, I connect to it over the internet, but I don't have to. I absolutely could enable private connectivity so I'm not going through the internet. I have some dedicated, maybe part of my MPLS to get to those resources. Maybe I don't want them externally internet facing. If I think about Azure, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, they're examples of public cloud. And the key part here is I have access only to certain aspects of the system, the resources they are exposing to me. The responsibility, well, that's gonna depend on exactly what the type of service is. But a key point I can think about is even a public cloud, if I was to think of something like Azure, which is obviously the focus of this course. Azure has regions that we're gonna talk about that have lots of data centers in them. Well, that's providing capacity. There's not some strange magic going on. And then what that does, it exposes all different types of resource. Now it has a huge number of resources. While we think about maybe VMs, maybe a database, maybe a container, there are hundreds of different types of resource exposed through here. And one of the great things about the public clouds and Azure is my interactions all go through a certain control plane. In this case, it's something called the Azure Resource Manager. And if I'm using APIs through some sort of application I'm writing, if I'm using the graphical portal, if I'm using a command line interface through Bash or PowerShell, it doesn't matter what I'm using, they all go through this control plane. And the key point here is that, hey, all these resources, the level of responsibility I have will depend on what is that type of resource. Is it really a hosted VM? 
or is it more of some platform service? It's a serverless offering. It's a web-based service. It's a managed database. And I'll only be responsible for certain aspects of that. But all the underlying infrastructure, physical boxes, hypervisors, I'm never gonna see, even if it's a virtual machine. So in the public cloud, it's available to many different tenants. And typically I'm gonna go and access it over the internet, but I could establish private connectivity as well. It's not exclusively, hey, I have to talk to it over the internet. Then there are some organizations that will share a certain amount of infrastructure. You'll hear this idea of community cloud. So if I'm the government, the government may say, set up their own sets of infrastructure and then share it among the different governmental agencies that exist because they don't want to share with other people. Now, Azure has a Gov Cloud, so it's operated by Azure, but the only people that are allowed to operate inside it are government agencies or contractors the government deems, yes, we want them, they work with us, we want them in this cloud. And of course, a combination. Hybrid is very, very common. This could be I'm hybrid because hey, today I'm running on premises and I'm starting to move out to the public cloud. It could be, well, I run some things on-prem. I run some things that are better suited for the public cloud. Maybe I can even burst out. So I host a service on-prem. If I get a really busy day, I can extend out and then use capacity in the cloud. Because one of the nice things we'll see is with the cloud, I pay for what I use. So it's really useful where I have some inconsistency, some seasonality, i.e. variation in the load, well, I can adjust the amount of resource I have to meet the amount of load coming in. So this really is a, a big use case for this. So there are different types of cloud services. Obviously, Azure is a public cloud, but Azure does bring a lot of capabilities to my on-premises as well. I can use that Azure control plane to help orchestrate and manage things on premises. Even certain Azure services, I can bring on premises. And we'll talk about that throughout this course. I said cloud, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud. So what, what's a cloud? Is this just a, a fancy name for a hypervisor? There are many definitions. I remember one of my customers said once, if you ask five different people for a definition of the cloud, you'll get seven different answers. And it's very, very true. But there are some core standard definitions of characteristics we definitely do expect from a cloud. And so what the difference is between a cloud and a hypervisor is it's not a different hypervisor. It's not a different box I have to go and buy. It's the management software you run against or to the side of that hypervisor, whatever else it is, that provides these characteristics we're gonna talk about. So I can absolutely light up a private cloud through certain management and orchestration. On-demand self-service, the idea being that the users I have enabled for a certain cloud within a certain quota and maybe certain capabilities can directly go and provision, i.e. create the resources within that quota and within the scope of what they're allowed to use themselves. They don't have to go and talk to a human being and say, hey, create this for me. So there's an element of self-service. Broad network access. So I can access these services through standard mechanisms, standard protocols. They could be thick or thin platforms. Resource pooling. In the old days, every application would have its own box or two boxes. And you tended to waste a lot of resource because it wasn't using a lot of it. So I'd have all these siloed islands for app one, app two, app three, app four. Maybe I'd start to get a bit sophisticated and they'd share a storage area network, but often I'd have these islands that would maybe use five or 10%, so a huge waste. So I could be running a lot more on them, but also if ever they needed some peak, maybe they were super busy on one day of the year or one hour of the day, that seasonality, I had to scale the boxes to that biggest possible size ever. And maybe 90% of the time, it sat mostly idle. If I bring all those islands together and pull them into one set of resources, applications can then share that pool of resources, which means I have a lot less waste, 
But then also assuming that seasonality is different, when one is busy, one is quiet, the more apps I pull together, the greater the averaging of that resource utilization will get, well, they can scale and get more resource when they need it, but then release it for other applications for when they need it. So we like this idea of resource pooling, not having those islands, which leads to this idea of rapid elasticity. My allocation of resource for any particular app or tier of an app, I don't have to scale all the different tiers, maybe it's a web front end, maybe there's a business logic, maybe there's a database, they can all scale individually as needed rapidly, I, as the load increases, I can scale to meet it, as the load decreases, I can scale down and stop wasting resource and free it up for someone else. So by doing that pooling, I have lots of resource available and that cloud's gonna give me these scale capabilities. And a measured service. Maybe I do wanna do show back, which is, hey, business unit A, this is how much resource you're using. Or maybe even that show back, I might do charge back. I bill them for the amount of resource they're using. And those are defined in a very specific document. Now, if I think of types of service, it's all about responsibility. That's what it really boils down to. I, as a company, unless I'm in an IT business, and even then, for the most part, I don't care about the IT. I don't care about a physical box. I don't care about operating system. I don't care about a runtime. I care about my application that is bringing business value to my company, that helps my company make money, that differentiates my company from another company. All I care is about the business value. Everything else is cost of business, I have to do it, I don't really want to be doing it. So as we talk about types of service, it's about shifting who is responsible, and ideally most companies want to be as responsible for as little as possible that's not generating revenue. So I'm gonna, I like pizza. And I can think about, well, pizza, initially, I could make it at home. Now, if I make my pizza at home, I'm responsible for getting the pizza dough and the sauce and the cheese and the toppings. I have to have power, fire, an oven. I need electricity or gas. I want some drinks. I need a table, somewhere to eat it at. I need cutlery, I need plates. I need everything. I have complete control of all these elements, the exact contents of the dough, the exact type of cheese, the exact ingredients in my sauce, the exact type of oven, but I have all the responsibility. I have to think about all of those things. Now, if I start shifting to a take and bake, I go somewhere and they've pre-made the pizza. All I have to do is take the pizza, so I'm not focused anymore about the pizza dough or the cheese, it's provided for me. All I focus on is taking that pizza, but I have to provide my own power, my own fire, my own oven, my own table and cutlery and drinks. I can get pizza delivery. So now I'm shifting even more of the responsibility. I don't have to think about cooking it anymore. The power, the electricity, the oven, but I still need drinks. I still need a place to eat it. Probably not cutlery, That's where that came from. We just use our hands. I just need to provide. So I'm responsible for less and less, but it also means well, I have less control about these things. Maybe I don't care. And that's probably the case. When a pizza gets delivered to me, do I care about the oven they used? Do I care about where they got the electricity from? No, as long as it tastes good, that's all I care about. Or it could be a complete dining out. I'm not responsible for anything other than consuming and eating my yummy pizza. And I like pizza. Pizza will come up quite a lot. So we can apply this same idea to computers, thankfully. If I think about a stack, there's networking, there's storage, there's the physical compute servers. There's typically a hypervisor, Hyper-V, VMware. There's an operating system, Windows, Linux. Middleware systems, those abstractions, maybe it's MQ or some kind of bus technology, a runtime to run my application like .NET or Java Enterprise Edition, J2E. And then I get to my application and my data. This is what I care about. This is what provides the business value. But on premises, my organization is responsible for everything, different teams most likely, but I also have all the control. I can pick every aspect of this. 
as we start moving to cloud services, even if it's private, what I want to offer people, we start off with infrastructure as a service. And what this can be thought of is as a virtual machine at a very basic level. So here the vendor, this is Microsoft if it's Azure, this could be your IT team on premises if it's a private cloud, they're responsible for the hypervisor, for the physical fabric, the compute, the storage, the networking. The consumer of infrastructure as a service gets a virtual machine. They're responsible for everything inside that virtual machine. The operating system, installing middleware, installing runtimes, maintaining them, which means patching, firewall, policy, backup, disaster recovery, the list goes on and on. So I have all of the flexibility still within that VM, but I have all the responsibility. I have to think about all those different elements. Now, when we talk about Azure and we talk about a VM, there are extensions, there are services that help me do all of those things I just said, backup, DR, policy, firewall, anti-malware, you name it, there are things that help me. But I'm still responsible for thinking about that tooling. And then we get to the bits we really care about. Then we have platform as a service. So now the vendor is even taking care of the operating system, the middleware, the runtime. They're taking care of the patching of the backup. If they do backup, they may not need to. They just provide a place for me to deploy my custom app with my data. My focus on my line of business application is just my app. I don't care about all of those other things. And when we talk about PaaS, this also could be a database as a service. I just think about my schema, my configuration, the data I put inside it. Could be desktop as a service. It's a place where I'm publishing applications or entire desktops. And then there's software as a service. Now this isn't Azure. This will be more something like Microsoft 365, Office 365, Dynamics 365. It provides the business application, the end service I need. Whereas PaaS is not really providing the business application. It's providing that foundation I can build my business application on, but it's not doing the business logic. Whereas a SaaS is actually doing that business logic, it's providing that capability for me. Minecraft is a good example of this. I could run my own Minecraft server and I could do it by running it inside a VM. I would have to install the OS, I'd have to install the Java runtime, I'd have to install the Minecraft app, but I can add a lot of configuration and flexibility in that. Or Minecraft offers Realms, where it's just a complete hosted solution. And I just think about, well, maybe I want to do an extra backup of my world, but I'm not thinking about any kind of OS or Java runtime. I'm not thinking about the Minecraft executable and updating any of that. So I get different levels of responsibility. I have to do less and less as I move up here, but I might get a bit less configuration, a bit less flexibility. Well, I can't add maybe certain types of add-ins when I use more of the PaaS and the SaaS. For most companies, I wanna get as far to here if I can. If there's a SaaS solution that does what I need, fantastic, I'm gonna go with that. If it's a custom line of business application, how far on the PaaS scale can I get? Now there's different types of PaaS. I can think of serverless, where I just pay for the work something does and it's triggered by something happening, an item arrives on a queue a file is placed somewhere, a timer, um, an API call comes in. Maybe it's a container environment, a Kubernetes, maybe it's hosting a, a web service, app service, or maybe it is more of those auto-scalable virtual machine-based resources. An important point though, when we think about the cloud, I remember when I originally spoke to customers, they were like, well, how long will it take once I provision a VM to have it available? for the, you to rack the server. There's no racking of servers that will impact your service. Obviously, behind the scene, there are servers. There are servers in racks, in clusters, in data centers. But this is massive scale. These are all available. There's lots of idle capacity waiting for customers to provision. So when I create something, there's no delay other than a couple of minutes for most things. It just has to go through and maybe copy your VM image to the new storage and go through some specialization routine and it's up and running. 
So if ever you hear, well, it's going to take us a couple of weeks, that's not a public cloud. There's something else going on with that. Now, when should I use them? And there is no right or wrong answer to this. Every company has different priorities. Every company has different goals. Every company has different top level objectives of what they want to be. But it's all about shifting responsibility. It's all about being able to consume more advanced types of service and enabling the business to really focus on what matters. If I think about most companies today, they're going through a number of transformations. Digital transformation is huge. It's the idea of shifting, how do we do business? How do we actually perform our transactions? And it's moving from those old style ways to IT based. It's moving to online business. It's moving to technology solutions for my business activities, for my transactions, for my operations. When I move to the cloud, it lights up a lot of those scenarios. Maybe I just wanna modernize my business. And once again, if we think about, well, on premises, maybe I had VMs, okay? I wanna modern, modernize, I wanna to go to containers or PaaS services or database services. They're just, just all readily available when I think of the public cloud. So moving to the cloud can be a catalyst to modernize my architecture. Maybe I just wanna enrich my environment. Now, different organizations, they have different priorities. They can operate services, they can operate data centers at different price points. It will always come up. Oh no, I can run my data center cheaper. That's really pretty unlikely. I've seen a lot of reports on this. The electricity bill alone for most companies would be more than, hey, I can run those services in Azure. There's a certain amount of efficiency. We think about data centers, the power coming in, how much of that is used to actually provide service as opposed to wasted through other cooling and environmental factors. And if you look at things like Azure, this is just an interesting thing to look at. Azure's really been working on this PUE and it's all about this power usage effectiveness. And the Azure data centers are just some of the lowest in the world. So it's all about this idea, total energy needed for the facility, how much is actually used for the computing. And Azure is getting really close to almost one, i.e. it's super, super efficient. But they also talk about, well, water usage effectiveness and how efficient and how much they could not waste in those various environments. And so maybe you believe you can run it cheaper. It's probably not the truth if you really factor in everything the physical building, the power, the networking, the people, the security, the tax on the building, the buying the physical racks. If you think of everything, it's actually pretty unlikely, but what other factors do you have as an organization? Maybe I'm trying to minimize my environmental impact and move into these public clouds. They have better efficiency than me. But I just don't wanna be in that business in the first place. I wanna focus on how can I just provide my business value? I always think about the old factories. The old factories used to generate their own power. But then the utility companies came along who could operate cheaper and have better quality of power. So the factories stopped having their own generators and they used the grid. For a large part, the technology for computing is going that same way. Requirements for resiliency, DR, business continuity, high availability. I might have a great data center well, where's my DR? That means I have to have a second data center or maybe a third data center. I gets really expensive for saying I hope I never ever have to use. Proximity. I have customers in Europe, multiple parts of Europe, east and west coast of the US, all over the world. Do I wanna operate data centers at all of those locations? Or I can use a public cloud service who have regions in all of those different geographically distributed areas and I can just stand up a couple of VMs or an app service in each of those. They provide this geographical routing. They provide the failover. Hey, it's a lot better for me and my customer experience that now there's instances of my service all throughout the world. I just couldn't practically do that on premises. So that could be a very, very big reason for wanting to actually do this. 
I only pay for what I use. So think about the R scenario for a second. If it's not running, I'm not paying for it. Now, there might be certain licenses. It depends on the type of DR we're doing. Maybe there's some storage I'm paying for. I'm probably not paying for the compute side. So I'm paying a lot less money. I pay for the amount of storage I'm using, not for the amount I might need over the next five years, which I have to do with a SAN. I pay for the number of hours that compute service is running, not 24 seven. And again, if I think about auto scale, and I change the number of resources based on the load coming in, paying for what I'm using is really, really important. And that's very hard to do with us on premises. We have the physical boxes. So this fact that I pay for what I'm using opens up a lot of key scenarios that are unique to the public cloud. The one I like the most, because it involves pizza. It's Super Bowl. I can't stand American football. I tried to watch it once in my first year in the country and it was the most boring thing in the world. But don't judge me, personal preference. However, if I'm a pizza restaurant, what I learned was on a typical Friday evening, a pizza restaurant might be three times busier than any other night of the week. Which means for maybe five hours on a Friday night, or well, as a pizza restaurant, I have to have three times the amount of infrastructure available to take orders. The rest of the time, it's only a third being utilized. What a waste. Super Bowl, people eat a lot of pizza, three times more than even a Friday night. So now for a period of what seems like 18 hours, but I think it's a four hour game, I need three times even the infrastructure that I need for a Friday night. Well, that's ridiculous. That would mean for the rest of the year, and most times, it's only using a ninth of the overall capacity. That's insane. Think about the public cloud, or well, I could burst up for those four hours and then shrink back down again. I'd only pay for whatever the seasonality, that variation in requirement of load is to meet the requirement. And that idea of only paying for what I need lends itself to a number of scenarios. So the pizza is predictable bursting. I know there's a seasonality, but I, and I know what it is. I know 8 a.m. every day during the week, people come and log on, so there's a certain amount of authentication storm. In the evenings, I'm a pizza restaurant. I'm a tax company, I get a tax month once a year. I'm hosting the Olympic site every four years. There's some kind of predictable bursting, so that ability to scale up and down and only pay for the amount I'm scaled, that's a key scenario. I'm starting out. Maybe I'm a new company. Maybe I'm a new project. Maybe I'm a new app. But I'm something new. Maybe I don't even know what my growth is going to be. But the cloud has this infinite amount of resource available. If I'm growing, I'm being successful. I'm generating money so I can pay for the additional load and additional resource to support that load. So if I'm growing fast, great, I can do that. And there's an opposite of that. It's also really useful if it then fails. <laughs> Companies fail. If I have to get some huge initial outlay of capital, capital expenditure, to buy a whole bunch of servers, well, that's very stressful on my startup. Huge amount of money I need to buy all this stuff. And then if I fail, it's all been wasted. And spending all that money may encourage me to fail because it's put a real strain on my finances. Whereas the public cloud is operational expenditure. It's not upfront. I pay for it as I operate, as I'm running my company. So there's not a big initial outlay, and I just pay for what I'm using as I grow. So if I do fail, I've not wasted a bunch of money, and I didn't have that huge capital expenditure that stressed my finances from the start. It could be unpredictable bursting. Running a site, some celebrity mentions my site, and I get this huge spike in traffic. Well, my auto scale. This huge spike in interest comes in, I scale up my resources to meet it. And maybe it's even on and off. Again, that Olympic scenario. I'm only on for a few weeks every four years. Tax company, I'm only on for a month every 12 months. Whatever that is, I can stop and start it and just pay for what I need. So all of these are because I pay for what I'm using at any particular second in time. So we typically see 
I'm trying to build trust in the cloud. I might start my test and dev. Now you have to be careful with test and dev. Test and dev has a huge amount of churn. Create, delete, create, delete, create, delete, which means the cloud is fantastic for that. When I think of testing though, make sure your final test environment does match production. I don't wanna go and do all my testing in Azure and then run in production on a completely different platform. The final validation test should be on the same platform as production. But definitely because of that high churn, using the public cloud, the ability to spin up the environments very quickly and tear them down, it's super useful for that. Disaster recovery. I only pay for it when I'm using it. I'm not paying for a second data center that's mainly idle. Hey, I'll use the public cloud for that. DMZ, I've got internet facing properties and I'm not that comfortable with my security or my processes that I wanna host it out of my data centers. So that public facing stuff, I'll stick in the public cloud. Other things, I'll have a, an isolated separate network. Maybe I do connect them and I've got a very strict firewall, but that internet facing, I'm gonna get off of my infrastructure. Special projects. Comes back to that idea of churn and spinning things up quickly, pay for what I need. I don't want the capital expenditure. I can go and run it up there. A lot of this is about capital expenditure, buying a big asset versus operational expenditure. Hey, I'm paying the thing to run it for any given week or month. But many are just all in. Many companies today realize, yes, the cloud's cheaper, realistically, but also it offers a lot more types of service. It enables me to accelerate. It enables me to do that scaling and operate for what I need as a company. They don't want to be in the data center business. They don't want to operate physical data centers and have the security and all of the people just managing servers. They'd rather have those people focus on better things that drive the business value. They help differentiate the business. So they want to get out of the data center business. It doesn't bring them any benefit. They'd much rather have resources in the public cloud. I can have them all distribute over tens of regions so I get great end customer performance because now I'm very close to them. And I can really focus on the business value, not doing stuff that's really not my speciality. Now, I said a few times about well, Azure has a huge number of services. This is a really old picture and it's not relevant at all. I show it only because even back then, many years ago, there was a huge number of services. These numbers are completely wrong. There's way more than 32 regions, but there were a lot of services. What's more realistic now is Let's actually jump over for a second. Let me jump over to this site again. We actually have here, this is a list of all of the Azure products. So AI and machine learning, and I'm not gonna go through this. Again, the link is in the description below. These are all the AI services. These are the analytic services, different types of compute service container services, database services. And look at the database, MySQL, SQL, MariaDB, CosmosDB, Postgres, Redish Cache, Developer Tools, DevOps, Hybrid, Identity, Integration, IoT. The list goes on and on and on. Just a crazy number of services are available. So as I think about as a company, I want to have some line of business application I want to create. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to host the VM and host the middleware and host the runtime and install some stuff. If it's just available, what's the minimum I can do to provide that business value? Now in terms of actually getting Azure, and if you're learning, you still want to get Azure, get some hands on. There's a free one month trial. So if I, there we go, jump over to there. Now, the nice thing about this is, you get a certain amount of credit for a month. So I get this, hey, 30 days, $200 to spend. But what you also get is for 12 months, I get a whole bunch of services. So I get a B1S virtual machine I can run for 750 hours. So I get a Windows and I get a Linux. I get an Azure SQL database, I get some blob storage, I get a Cosmos DB, I get some app service. 
if I look at all of them actually, some of them are always, some of them are for 12 months. So there's a whole bunch of always, like Azure Functions, I get a whole bunch of Azure Functions, always. This Cosmos DB, I get a certain amount of Cosmos DB, always. So I can do a lot of things for free. There are a lot of things I can do for 12 months. So if I'm learning, if I'm experimenting, go through and look at all of the different things that are available because there really is a lot of things there to help you learn. And the best way to learn is to just get hands on. Think of a project you wanna do and start doing it. If I've got Visual Studio Enterprise, well, there's also a certain amount of credit I get there as well. This used to be the MSDN, but what we'll see is depending on the level, you either get $150 a month, $100 or $50. So if I have that Visual Studio, depending on the version I have, hey, I get a certain amount of Azure credit there as well. If it's production, I just pay, I could pay as I go. I get the bill based on what I'm doing. If I'm an organization, I can create an enterprise agreement. I get an enterprise enrollment. Now, I've, it's got departments in here. They're being phased out. They had a function, but they weren't that good. They were around billing. Tags, management groups are much, much better. And we're gonna talk about those when we talk about governance. But they do let me have account owners and they can create subscriptions. Subscriptions are the really end resource container into which I create my Azure resources. And I might separate those into different subscriptions, which we'll talk about. So that enterprise enrollment lets me centralize the billing. It lets me have different owners to create different subscriptions for their business unit or for their application. It lets me purchase things at a higher level. Maybe I get a discount. Maybe I could buy certain reservations to get discount on certain types of service. And I might operate those in different ways, maybe based on business unit, maybe based on geography. There's not a right or wrong but there are those different ways I might think about using them. There are limits. When I get my Azure subscription, there were quotas, there were limits. I don't want to just go off and accidentally, and this happens a lot, people go and create stuff or leave it turned on, and by their own, they would consume a huge amount and run up a huge bill. So there are many limits that are there, some of them are soft, i.e. they can be increased, and they're there initially to stop you harming yourself. Some of them are hard limits. I can have the maximum amount of things in a certain subscription. Initially, they are fairly low, again, to protect yourself, but you can increase them. There are articles that go through all of the different limits for all the different types of resources. Is it hard or soft? You can increase the limits, both through the Azure portal, and also there's an API now that lets you go and do this as well. And it lets me see, well, what's my limit? How much have I used? And to actually go and request that increase. And I can enable or remove spending limits. So I can put spending limits in place on there. If we were to look really quickly, and if I was just go to, for example, my subscription. So if I go to my subscriptions, this is the Azure portal. We'll come back to this later on. One of the things I can see is usage and quotas under my settings. And if I look at my usage and quotas, it's gonna show me what all of my different quotas are and how much I'm using of each individual quota. So I can see the details of it. And you'll also see, hey, I could request the quota increase from this page as well. So it makes it very easy to go and see and operate those things. Now, one thing to really think about in the cloud that might be different from what you do on premises. On premises, we're used to using the hardware to provide all the resiliency. I think about having a SAN, and my SAN has multiple controllers and lots of different power and lots of copies of the data but I have one SAN and I really hope it's really resilient. I have clusters of hosts that if a host failed, the VM moves over and I, I kind of hope that something goes wrong with the cluster software. 
I migrate VMs between hosts. I do maybe live migration or vMotion, whatever that technology is, to avoid downtime. But the challenge with those approaches are, well, migrating a VM works great if it's a planned host level issue, but if it's the OS or the app needs a patch, I still have to reboot it, there's still downtime. If the host crashes, well, it still has to then restart the VM on another node. So there's a certain limited amount of resiliency really when you think about that. And I typically have a lot of single instance workloads. It's just one thing running this. In the cloud, it's better to use software for the resiliency. We think about lots of instances, maybe smaller instances, distributed, maybe over different racks, maybe over different data centers, maybe over different regions. Ideally, at least different data centers and ideally different regions as well. So there's multiple instances of my storage of my compute services. Because things like VMs are typically not migrated during maintenance. There are technologies that are sometimes used, but often it's not. Now, if there is maintenance on the host, they use VM preserving host updates. It might be paused for 30 seconds. But the way we don't have downtime is, well, I have at least two instances of my service and they're on maybe two different racks. Maybe they're in two different data centers within the region. And the way Azure rolls out its updates when it's planned is it won't affect both of them at the same time. If there was a failure, well, there's still one running. And there's balancing technologies at the networking level typically to say, hey, if this one's not responding, send it to the other one. And I maybe I've got three or 10 or 20 instances, and maybe that varies depending on the load. We think of that scaling capability. So we try and shift from focusing on, we really hope this hardware is super resilient, so let's build in resiliency through software-defined networking, through software-defined storage, through multiple instances that not only make it more resilient, because I've got lots of instances now, but it also enables me to better match the demand by adding and removing them as I need it. Now, the Azure data centers are super resilient. Don't get the impression that it's just, hey, it's someone's closet. It's not. They've got generators and UPS and fantastic security. They are super, super resilient. But even with that, the focus is still about, hey, each service has a certain service level agreement. But to get the best out of this, we really like to use the software to think about keeping our service available. So when I think about the cloud, using the different resource types, using the software capabilities, is the only realistic way to think about resiliency. Trying to think about some piece of hardware being really, really solid is not gonna work. So I factor this in as part of my architecture. I don't like single instances in the cloud. I wanna be able to have multiple instances to get that distribution to also then let me scale to match demand. So why use Azure? Uh, there's a lot of different solutions out there. Gartner has this magic quadrant idea. And it's about, well, there are different types of companies and there's leaders. Leaders have the best ability to execute and they have the most completeness of vision, i.e. typically the, the best features that around any particular area. And Gartner has these quadrants around nearly every type of service. Microsoft are in the leader quadrant for nearly everything they operate in. But cloud infrastructure and platform services, the VMs, the PaaS services, their leader. Access management, so the identity side, they're a leader. Cloud database management services, they're a leader. AI, they're a leader. A whole bunch of different security offerings around endpoint protection and cloud access security broker and security information and event management, so SIM solutions, they're leaders. So they're leaders in just a huge number of these things and on-premises as well. I think that hybrid solution. So Microsoft can provide leading solutions across the entire breadth of the IT landscape. Now, this actually comes out a lot less than it used to. There would be these questions about, what about feature X? I need feature X. And you, you draw this squiggly line on the board. And people look at you like, what's the squiggly line for? Um, let's hope it's not someone's heartbeat. It's like something from TV. It's the Gartner hype cycle. And it's all about technology, but it really does apply to anything. 
you go and you buy yourself a new car. Oh, it's super exciting. Oh, it doesn't do this. Oh, okay, it's pretty good. So we have these uh, triggers. We get this peak of inflated expectations. This thing, this technology is gonna cure all the problems of the world. Then you get this trough of disillusionment. <laughs> oh, it doesn't. You get a slope of enlightenment. You start to then calm down and realize what it really can do. Then you get this plateau of productivity, actually doing useful stuff. This is when you focus on features. What does it do? Does it do this? Does it do this? Does it do this? This is when you're focused on integration, actually solving problems. And that's where most companies actually want to get to. And so, yes, does it have a certain feature may initially seem really important. The reality is for the most part, it will not be important in the longer run. We think of the bigger picture, how are we actually gonna be productive along it. Now, that's not to say Azure doesn't have most features, they're not trailblazing on things, but I would urge many people to not super focus on any particular moment in time feature they want for any kind of big overall decision. So what does all this mean? Again, this was just a, a foundation. Azure is realistically, I would say one of the two big guys. Now, I'm obviously biased. My day job, although this channel has nothing to do with it, my day job, I do work for Microsoft. I think Microsoft is one of the two big ones, Azure and AWS. I think even Google Cloud is kind of sliding down there a bit. They spend billions of dollars to create these regions, to create these services, to create these security teams, to offer true mega scale clouds. Most of the other people just cannot compete. Everyone else will be niche players. Maybe they're niche because of the certain geographical area they work in. Maybe they're niche just because of the size of their cloud and they've got a certain group of clients they're gonna operate in. Maybe they're niche because of the feature they offer. Maybe I'm just a very focused type of database I'm gonna offer in my cloud. But really, apart from Azure and AWS and maybe GCP, there's not many true hyperscale clouds out there. So you're betting on a good horse. And if Azure does become self-aware with all of the new machine learning and AI, I Skynet, at least it will treat you nicely as one of its early adopters. So that was it for the introduction. This was purely just to ground a few things about understanding what is the cloud, how we think about the cloud. And then the next modules will really dive into particular aspects so you can become really proficient in Azure. So let's carry on.